Well, certainly it is a, a great affirmation as we gather here this morning that, that uh, all of it's about proclaiming how great God is to, to extend love, to work in and through us. It's, it's sort of at the heart of this sermon series that we've been in so far in 2023 that we've, we've called Going Viral that sort of plays off of this idea that in the world that we live in now, there are these videos that go viral so quickly. They're they're shared so quickly and so widely, and, and we want our faith to be something that's shared, that's shared widely with other people. And, and as we're focusing in these weeks on evangelism, uh, what we recognize is that for many of us, it's, it's really inviting us to rethink what we, what we understand it means to be an evangelist, to be someone who shares good news. For many of us, we're having to to set aside some of the experiences or some of the, the, the images that we have of that. And we're really trying to embrace that, that it begins for us with, with a, a, a reflecting and a, a reconnecting to our own story, to the ways in which this, this love that God has, the, the, the why God's love, the how God's love that we experience in Jesus has been and is good news in our own lives. That ultimately, as we, as we try to deepen that awareness and connection of, of that love that God extends to us, that includes us, that accepts us, that embraces us, that forgives us, that, that calls us to, to be a part of this thing we call community, this thing we call church, right? How has that and is that good news for us? What does it mean for us to, to then want to be, to show up? in person and online to be a part of a church that, that isn't existing just to serve itself, but in, in many respects exists to serve others, to serve one another, and to be open to, to one another, believing that in, that in that diversity of what it means to be God's people, of experience, of perspective, of season of life, of, of any number of categories, that in that diversity and the distinctiveness that we make individually... Somehow collectively we become something that allows us to, to more deeply, more richly, more fully live in the reality of God's love. And that's what we're trying to share, to invite others to experience with us. And so as we've been doing that, I've loved the conversations that I'm having with many of you about what it means to rethink evangelism. And I love the conversation I had with one of you this past week that that sort of led to the statement that the person made that said, well, evangelism really is not my gift. There's other people who do that better than me, and I think they should do that. Which, as we chuckle, probably isn't just one person's feeling, right? There's, there's a handful of us here probably that, that really think evangelism's great, but somebody else should do that. They would do it better than me anyways. And maybe online you have that same sentiment. And, and as I was thinking about that, it got me to thinking about Brock Purdy. Now, even Steve Harrington, even Steve Harrington, our former associate pastor who I had coffee with this past week, even he knows who Brock Purdy is. So I'm pretty sure most of us, Pastor Nia, Brock Purdy, got nothing. So Dania does not. That's, I knew there was someone. So Brock Purdy is the current quarterback of the San Francisco 49ers. He, he is sort of known as Mr. Irrelevant because in this most recent NFL draft, he was the last player selected. So they call him Mr. Irrelevant. And he came to the 49ers as their third string quarterback. The first string quarterback got hurt. The second string quarterback got hurt. And now Brock Purdy, as many of us have seen over the last few months, is going to be leading the 49ers this afternoon in the NFC Championship game. And, and here's why I think of Brock Purdy, right? The, the question of whether or not there is someone out there who is better than him or might even be more equipped than him to lead the 49ers today is kind of a question that misses the point, right? Whether or not there is someone out there that might be able to do it better doesn't really matter because it's his time and it's his opportunity. And I think it can be easy for us to think that there's someone else out there that's more skilled or more gifted in ministry than we are, but more often than not, that's just a convenient distraction. It's really not about if there's someone better than this than you. 
than me, than us. It's about when is our time? What is our time and what is our opportunity? That's why I love this passage from Mark chapter 6 so much is that it sort of speaks to this. And what I love about it is that it speaks to this in the midst of Mark's gospel. Chapter 6, there's 10 chapters remaining, right? So we know it's far from over for the disciples. And yet, here we are in chapter 6, they're being sent out without having everything figured out. They're sent out understanding much, understanding much, but needing to learn more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And if we look at Mark's gospel, what we know is that in chapter 3, they're called in order to be sent, but then in chapter 4, they don't understand the parables. In chapter 6, not long from the passage that Pastor Christina just read, they won't understand what happened with the loaves and the fishes. In chapter 8, they won't understand what happens with the loaves and the fishes the second time. In chapter 16, we know Mark's gospel ends with them fleeing away, committing to tell no one about the empty tomb. And so many of us can resonate with the disciples, I think, because, because so oftentimes we're not sure we are ready or we are equipped or we know and understand all that needs to be known and understand in order to, to share our faith and to, to be a part of this evangelistic movement of good news that, that we're talking about here during these weeks. Perhaps we can find comfort that in the midst of all of this not understanding and not knowing, we find this passage from Mark chapter 6. Do you really think in chapter 6 the disciples felt ready? Absolutely not. There's no way they felt ready. And Scripture will continue to tell us that there is never a time when they, and likely never a time then we, will fully feel ready and equipped for what might be asked of us on God's behalf. But our passage says some lovely things about this. In verse 7, it talks about how they were sent out in pairs and, and sort of affirms what we affirm today in this annual meeting, that, and that is that ministry is meant to be done together. Right? Ministry is something that's entrusted to us. It's a we activity, not a me activity. And as we do that, what we then see in verse 8 is that they're sent out and told to take nothing but a dependence upon God, a reliance and a trust that God will provide and take care of them in the midst of what they're asked to do, this prayerful openness to how God will lead them. And in verse 10, one of my favorite phrases where they're told to stay in that place until they leave. Sort of this reminder that, that we sort of need to be present to one another. That in a world that is so distracted and can become so preoccupied with other things, we need to stay and be present with people. A ministry that, that sees and hears people. A friend of mine this past week said that we're really called to be where our feet are. I love that image, right, of being where our feet are. And as Scripture so oftentimes does, Scripture in verse 11 sort of reminds us that it, that it doesn't always work. It doesn't always go the way we thought. In verse 11, there are those who don't want to hear it. And Jesus reminds them that they got to find a way to move on. That the job is not to stay there and bludgeon people with what we think they need to hear and know, but to, to be willing to walk away and to, to trust that somehow God will continue to be at work. Because also, ultimately what we see in this passage is that, is that it can and does work so oftentimes. Right? We see healings. We read about this. In the midst of a gospel that, that speaks of their not understanding, we do see this moment of them accomplishing things on God's behalf. Because what we know is that these disciples are people just like us, and the person of faith does not experience or think about different things in life than, than secular or non-religious people. But the person of faith chooses to see them from a new perspective, uh, a different way, and perhaps allowing for a different possibility and outcome. The person of faith has learned or is learning to tell a different story, recognizing that, that our individual story is a part of the much larger story of how God's love is at work in the world. And we're invited to trust that God has already equipped us individually and as a church because we need to remind ourselves that God works through who we are rather than who we're not. 
God calls us to utilize what we have rather than fixate on what we don't have. And the desire is that we would remember that it's God at work in the world. And that doesn't depend upon us. We don't need to fool ourselves into thinking that it's our responsibility to bring Jesus to someone. Because honestly, God's at work long before you and I get there. And God will be at work long after you and I have gone. Our job, our call as individuals and as a church is to play our part and partnering with God and what God wants to accomplish in and through us in those moments. And to do so, to, to be active, to share what's going on in our lives or our ministry with the three or the two or the one or the ten people with whom we gather and for whom we are a trusted source. Nothing more, nothing less. The same is true, I think, of our church and our ministry. God is at work and God can, God will, God wants to be about transformation, the healing of our community. And, and this is a day where we affirm that and where, where we look back and look forward with respect to our church, sort of recognizing with gratitude perhaps that we're still in the midst of it. I don't know if we're in chapter 6, I don't know if we're in chapter 4 or chapter 9 or chapter 11, but, but the story of, of you, the story of me, the story of us isn't finished. We're in the midst of it. And our leadership is embracing God's call to, to bless and strengthen who we are and who we have been, even as we are open to adding and growing into who God is calling us to become. The year before us is filled with a a ton of challenges and a ton of opportunities. And we miss the point, I think, if we gather this morning waiting until we will feel fully equipped and fully ready and fully understanding everything. See, God's promise in this passage to each one of us individually and to our church collectively is that we already have all that we need. We are all that we need to play a part in what God wants to do in and through our ministry. And because of that, we embrace and lean into the purpose that that our love would overflow and that our lives and that our ministry will be a part of the transformation that God desires to see realized in and through this place during this time. And we're invited to have a boldness of faith a courageous faith that, that chooses to be a part of what God wants to do in this place during this time. Amen.